Hello dear students, welcome to the lecture 9 of Security of Information Systems. Uh, so today's topic is Identity Management and Access Control. Okay, so the outline of uh, today's course is like here. Identity and Access Management Concepts. Identity Management Models. Access Control Models. Security Models. Okay, so IAM, uh, which is Identity Access Management. So there is configuration phase. Uh, at the configuration phase, there is registration and provisioning and then authorization. So this part, uh, the green part is identity management and the yellow part is access management. And uh, at the configuration, configuration phase, there is authorization in access management and registration and provisioning in identity management. At the operation uh, side, uh, in identity management phase, there is self-identification, authentication. And at the op operation phase in access management uh, stage or phase, there is access control. <coughs> okay. Okay, so I will check something. Okay, so definition of uh, identity and access management is like here. Identity and access management I am, is the security discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right times for the right reasons. I am addresses the mission critical need to ensure appropriate access to resources across increasingly heterogeneous technology environments and to meet increasingly rigorous compliance requirements. Okay, so there is a link, let's check it out. Okay, it is the source of the definition. Let's continue. The concept of identity. Okay, let's try to understand what is the concept. So there are organizations like schools, persons like us, systems. I don't know, maybe like uh, broadcasters. These are the entities uh, that have identity. Uh, maybe our uh, smart devices can be also considered as systems such as our um, uh, robot uh, vacuum cleaners and such. So entities have identities, of course. You see there is a, a gray identity and some black and white boxed identity. And each one have different attributes such as names, identifiers, characteristics. Okay, let's continue. Concepts related to identity. So entity. A person, organization, agent, system, session, process, etc. So entity is basically any of these. So identity can be as. A set of names, attributes of entity in a specific domain. An entity may have identities in multiple domains. An entity may have multiple identities in one domain. Okay, so there is digital entity identity, which is... Digital representation of names, attributes in a way that is suitable for processing by computers. Okay, and... Names and attributes of entity can be unique or ambiguous within a domain. Transient or permanent, self-defined or defined by authority, interpretation by humans and or computers, etc. Okay, let's continue. Identity. Etymology, original meaning of words. Identity, equals, same one as last time. First time, authentication is not meaningful. Because there is no previous time. Because the identity first must be created, registered. Authentication requires a first time registration of identity in the form of a name within a domain. 
This is true. Whenever you register, uh, whenever you want to use a website such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or you want to make a purchase from an uh, e-commerce website, you register an account there. So you you create your uh, identity on that domain, and then uh, that identity will always uh, point to you. That is why we use uh, IDs in our uh, program software and that ID never changes throughout the lifetime of that entity because it is it be uh, it be a unique uh, thing to identify that entity I think you get the idea registration can be take two forms pre-authentication from previous identity e.g. passport Creation of new identity, e.g. newborn baby. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, examples uh, from real life. When you get a password, you use your identity uh, to get a password. Or, however, when you are a newborn, you get a new identity first. Okay. identity domains an identity domain has a name space of unique names okay and same user has separate identities in different domains okay so silo id domain in service a federated id domain uh, service b service c service d so in uh, silo id domain at service a the user gets ID 1 and, and in federated ID domain which has service B, C, D, the user gets ID 2. Uh, this is a very uh, common way of practice. Different domains uh, would uh, assign different IDs to the same entity. Identity domain structures. Silo domain with single authority, e.g. user ids in company network. Distributed hierarchic domain, e.g. DNS, domain name system. Federated identity domains. Identity domain can be used by many different service providers. Requires alignment of identity policy between domains. Okay. Maybe we can find some more information related to this. Hmm. Okay, so. SVID free users. Okay, so let's read it. Silo model is like this. Explain it. The main identity management system deployed currently in the world of the Internet is known as the silo model, as shown in FIG. 71.6. Indeed, the IDP and SP are mixed up and they share the same space. The identity management environment is put in place and operated by a single entity for a fixed user's community. Mm. Users of different services must have different accounts and therefore re-enter the same information about their identity, which increases the difficulty of management. 
Moreover, the users are overloaded by identity and password to memorize which produces a significant barrier to usage. Okay, for example, this is like uh, you own several uh, domains uh, on several name server providers such as on GoDaddy and Namecheap. For each uh, domain name, name provider, you register an, a different account. However, what you do is essentially having uh, domains from the same pool actually but since you use different uh, accounts in different services uh, it is hard to manage so this is called a silo model let's read the, the let's read the definition here as well identity silo is a standalone identity store that is specifically designed to support a particular software application Identity silos pose an information assurance and administrative problem for organizations because the access control rights and privileges controlled by an identity silo can't be traced back to authoritative sources or to human resource HR directives to add or remove employees. Okay, so identity silo is a single uh, source of identity uh, management for each service. Uh, you define uh, for each service you create an account uh, therefore it is hard to manage them centrally however in federated id domain uh, you use multiple services uh, from single management okay so now we get the idea taxonomy of identity management architectures okay identity management is split into two major branches which is uh, silo identity management and federated identity management the federated identity management is split into three uh, branches centralized federation distributed federation and hybrid fe hybrid centralized distributed federation okay so the silo identity management system is illustrated like this uh, there is silo idp sp idp so sp is uh, the user, for example, our school IDP is identity provider. Okay, so SP can be entity. Okay, and there is identity domain, which is the green area. There is user identifier for silo domain here, authentication token service login service provision okay so you see same entity same person gets three different identifiers for each identity domain here okay he can't use a single uh, account to manage multiple um, services use multiple services on each service you see service a service b service c he has to create a different account uh, he has to create a different password for each account and he has to log in each of them so this is silo identity management model okay uh, this is the usual one we are used to use such as on e-commerce websites such as on facebook twitter instagram etc we create an account uh, on each system and then we use that uh, particular account uh, to uh, manage uh, that system okay so silo id domains oh okay sp is a service provider idp is identity providers i see sp service provider equals idp identity provider so sp uh, so sp controls namespace and provides access credentials okay so the sp uh, uh, is uh, creating your user ID and providing you the access credentials and in silo ID domains SP and IDP is same you see they are same they are equal unique identifier assigned to each entity advantages sim simple to deploy low initial costs for uh service providers 
potentially good privacy disadvantages. Identity overload for users, poor usability, no business integration. Yes, we have to compose a different uh, uh, account for every service we use and that is uh, some uh, overload for us, that is true. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, this, these are the disadvantages of uh, silo uh, model, okay. Low acceptance of new services with separate ID and credentials. Users must provide same information to many service providers. For service providers, barrier to service bundling and data collection. Okay, so these are the dis disadvantages of silo ID model and there is the identity federation model. Identity federation. A set of agreements, standards and technologies that enable a group of SPs to recognize and trust user identities and credentials from different IDPs, CRPs and SPs. Okay, we know the IDP and CR, uh, SP, so let's see the CRP. Okay, so there are four main types of identity federation, which is, uh, first one is centralized, centralized federation. Centralized name space and management of credentials by single IDP, CRP. Okay, identity provider and credentials. Okay, creden creden credentials provider. So CRP is credentials provider. Okay, so the second type. Distributed identity with centralized authentication. Distributed name spaces managed by multiple IDPs. Centralized credentials authentication by single CRP. So the uh, third, uh, uh, third the, uh, the third type of the uh, federation style identity management is centralized identity with distributed authentication. Centralized name space managed by single IDP. Distributed management of credentials and authentication by multiple CRPs. And finally, Distributed Federation. Distributed name spaces and management of credentials by multiple IDPs and CRPs. Actually, Distributed Federation looks like a uh, silo ID style. Let's see. So identity, identity federation types, federation types, centralized identity. Google Plus. Why Google Plus can be given a centralized identity? Because they are all linked to Google. So Google uh, uses the same uh, identity management for all services it has. You just use your email, Gmail in this case, to log in every service of Google. Use every service of Google, therefore, Google is a very good example of centralized identity. So there is distributed identity, which is uh, given as Facebook and Twitter. However, they have centralized uh, authentication. What does this mean that uh, Twitter gives you different IDs for different services. However, they use the same authentication uh, service. What can be given as an example um, for this? For example, Twitter has a, a, some uh, ads, uh, ads, uh, ads platform or a developer platform. They give you different IDs. For example, developer give you the different developer ID. However, they use the same centralized authentication, same for Facebook. So there is distributed authentication and centralized identity example, which is given as ID Portal and Altin. I don't know these services. And there is distributed uh, authentication and distributed identity. The Eudorum, uh, Eudorum. Okay, so Eudorum looks like a, a mobile a service provider. Has the ID. I don't know. Let's check them.
Fader. Okay, I don't know any of this. Anyway, so you get the idea. Federation model types. Adar, India, and Google Plus are centralized Bekau. Because. Uh, hey, control and manage the domain's namespace of identities. They always verify the authentication credentials in their federations. Okay. Facebook and Twitter have distributed identities and centralized credentials because they do not manage identities which are ordinary email addresses, they always verify the authentication credentials in their federations. Okay, so this is a better explanation than mine, and let's see. The ID portal Norway has centralized ID and distributed authentication because Oh, I see. Identities are national ID numbers, managed by the government. Multiple private credentials providers verify credentials for authentication. Okay. Open ID and Edurome are distributed because Multiple ID providers control and manage namespaces for identities. The same ID providers also verify the credentials for authentication. Mm, open ID. So let's see some information related to Open ID. OpenID allows you to use an existing account to sign in to multiple websites, without needing to create new passwords. You may choose to associate information with your OpenID that can be shared with the websites you visit, such as a name or email address. With OpenID, you control how much of that information is shared with the websites you visit. With OpenID, your password is only given to your identity provider, and that provider then confirms your identity to the websites you visit. Other than your provider, no website ever sees your password, so you don't need to worry about an unscrupulous or insecure website compromising your identity. OpenID is rapidly gaining adoption on the web, with over 1 billion OpenID-enabled user accounts and over 50,000 websites accepting OpenID for logins. Several large organizations either issue or accept open IDs, including Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, AOL, MySpace, Sears, Universal Music Group, France Telecom, Novell, Sun, Telecom Italia, and many more. Okay, so this makes sense. Who owns or controls open ID? OpenID was created in the summer of 2005 by an open source community trying to solve a problem that was not easily solved by other existing identity technologies. As such, OpenID is decentralized and not owned by anyone, nor should it be. Today, anyone can choose to use an OpenID or become an OpenID provider for free without having to register or be approved by any organization. Okay, so now we get the idea of the four different uh, models of uh, federation types. Identity federation roles. Okay, there is users uh, as federation role. Needs identities and credentials to access multiple SPs. So entities. Uh... Service provider, SP needs to know identity of users and needs assurance of user authenticity for example facebook twitter uh, google are service providers identity provider idp controls namespace of identities 
Issues, registers identities for users. Identity provider can be your government or uh, Google, Facebook. They also provide identity. And uh, there is the credentials provider, CRP. Issues, registers credentials for users. Performs authentication of users. Uh, same, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they also, pro uh, they also uh, provide credit credentials. Okay, so uh, by the way, uh, Facebook and Twitter does, are not identity providers because you register them with your email. However, they also compose an, an identity for you actually in their system. But they define you with your email address. Uh, however, internally, they also provide an identity to you. But we count them as service provider and credit initials provider. Uh, Gmail is both service provider, identity provider, and credit initials provider, and such. Okay. Federation protocols. Authentication by one IDP, CRP, SP is communicated as a security assertions, cryptographic token, to other SPs that trust and accept the assertion of authenticity. Okay. Usually based on SAML protocol. Security assertions markup language. So what is this? Security Assertion Markup Language SAML, pronounced SAML-1, is an open standard for exchanging authentication and authorization data between parties, in particular, between an identity provider and a service provider. SAML is an XML-based markup language for security assertions statements that service providers use to make access control decisions. SAML is also a set of XML based protocol messages, a set of protocol message bindings, a set of profiles utilizing all of the above. An important use case that SAML addresses is web browser single sign on SSO. Single sign on is relatively easy to accomplish within a security domain using cookies, for example, but extending SSO across security domains is more difficult and resulted in the proliferation of non interoperable proprietary technologies. The SAML web browser SSO profile was specified and standardized to promote interoperability, too. Okay. Uh, involves multiple entities. User, IDP, CRP, SP, and sometimes broker entity. Okay, so service providers such as our university user is us. Uh, identity credit provider is someone else, some other service. And there is the broker uh, which separates, uh, which actually uh, links us through service provider and identity credentials provider. Okay, so let's continue. Advantage, disadvantage of federation. Okay, so advantages are improved usability uh, because you use single account to use multiple services. Allows SPs to bundle services and collect user info, of course, because we provide multiple services with single uh, account, therefore it is much easier to collect user information and uh, then you can know uh, all these information belongs to the same uh, user entity and Strengthen privacy through pseudonym identities. Okay. And what are the disadvantages? High technical and legal complexity. It is easy. It is harder to achieve federate, federation model. Uh, this is of course true because it requires uh, more complex uh, programming and technologies. Uh, high trust requirements between parties. Because you are letting some other party to authenticate the login. 
and you have to trust that of course uh, because with uh, that other parties uh, uh, trust you are letting a user to use your services each federation partner can potentially compromise security this is true um, privacy issues massive data collection is a threat to data privacy by the way this is a threat for users themselves not the uh, service providers or such and limited scalability limited by political and economical constraints it is harder to uh, scale it uh, an identity federation can become a new form of cyber yes this is also true and centralized federation is illustrated like here so in here you see they use the same user identifier here all linked and different service providers and they use same security assertion you see here uh, issued by the identity provider uh, so the user uses on the single account and single password to use all the services okay example facebook connect you see okay let's see saml protocol profile browser post security token via front channel federation circle of trust okay one more okay uh there is identity provider and service provider so how they uh communicate so the user uses browser to request for token from identity provider identity provider sends the token with uh, encryption to the browser then browser sends token to the service provider and service provider uh, verifies token with the federation circle of trust you see they are linked uh, with the broker then service provider once verifies the token is valid uh, they pro they start providing services uh, the token based authentication is pretty common in lots of uh, modern uh, services so this was the browser post security token via front channel there is also a browser artifact security token via back channel and here uh, the browser user uses browser to request for token then identity provider this time provides artifact so what is artifact Uh, authentication okay hmm. okay anyway it is called as artifact I guess then artifact is sent to the service provider then the service provider sends back artifact to the identity provider then identity provider provides a token to the service provider and once it is verified uh, the service provider starts providing service and this is the back channel you see the token is uh, sent back and forth by the back channel okay and there's open id connect protocol let's see it how it is done okay and federation agreement so service and uh, open id agrees uh, initially then client here requests resource from the service provider then the service provider sends list of identity providers then user selects one of the identity providers okay this can be like for example you want to log in let's say uh, your school website and your school website uh, gives the option to use your email or open id this is what it means you 
pick your uh, authentication identity provider to log in and you start using that uh, service then uh, the service provider re redirect client to get the token from identity provider you see there are always uh, redirects when you are using i think you know that uh, such services and from that redirection page you are supposed to log in and then client is uh, redirected to authentication uh, open id i mean identity provider and you see the authentication request and then the identity providers uh, provide the login page uh, where you enter your credit credentials such as your password and username and then uh, where is the seventh step okay you see uh, the client provides credentials such as your password and username as i said then uh, it is sent back to the uh, identity provider and uh, you see post credentials when you hit the login button uh, you send your credentials uh, usually over https actually it has to be over https for security if not it is not secure then identity provider provides you token and redirect you to service provider and with token here you see at the step 10 you forward token back to the service provider the service provider starts providing you the service okay open id connect characteristics based on open id and oauth 2.0 specifications oauth 2 is extremely popular i don't know if there is the um newer version for example you see using a 2.0 to access google api microsoft identity platform and oa2 and there are a lot of oa2 authentication for example let's write twitter okay it ha it it comes and facebook okay it comes you see authentication of the uh, Twitter with OAuth 2. Let's read it. OAuth 2.0 Bearer Token. OAuth 2.0 Bearer Token authenticates requests on behalf of your developer app. As this method is specific to the app, it does not involve any users. This method is typically for developers that need read only access to public information. This authentication method requires for you to pass a bearer token with your request, which you can generate within the keys and tokens section of your developer apps. Here is an example of what a request looks like with a fake bearer token plugged in. Okay, so you see these, these are uh, used in the current uh, authentication system. These are uh, not just, uh, let's say... Uh, not just theoretical uh, applications these are being used in practice sps establish federation agreements with idps beware of abuse of term authorization the open id connect standard uses authorization in the meaning of authentication and access contro open id connect used in the norwegian health id I am for the Norwegian health sector. Health professionals register open IDs that are independent of their national person numbers. Mapping between open IDs and person number exists but is protected. Google, Facebook and Twitter federations. Okay, so how they uh, use authentication? The user, by using browser, uh, request uh, service from let's say Google then uh, it goes to the service private oh by the way so this is something else this is how Google Facebook and Twitter are being uh, uh, authentication service okay not the identity providers or they are being identity provider as well yes authentication service 
Then the service provider asks Google, Facebook or Twitter. And then Google, Facebook, Twitter asks you to uh, log in by providing your ID and credentials. Then they are forwarded back to these uh, federations. Then they provide a token or asset authenticated user and then you can start using services. Uh, I am sure you have already encountered with Google login. Uh, it is the it is a good example of this or Facebook login. For example, in nowadays in mobile games, you can log in with Facebook or or the usual method is we log in with uh, Google Play services. That is exactly like this. Uh, okay and the network access okay let's check this so there is visitor which is being us and we use the edoram okay i had guessed this was related to network and i was true and then edoram checks which institution you are from then it sent back something. Okay, let's read this. Edurome has formal agreements with the public and private locations around Europe for network access. Home institutions universities are responsible for keeping user data and credentials correct and up to date. Networks provide internet access. Okay, I see. So this is distributed both in authentication and yes, uh, identity because uh, the authentication and identity is given by the universities. Adoram is just the uh, middle service provider here. Fele's Electronisk Identitet. The FEDE is also another uh, distributed identity and distributed authentication. Let's read about that as well. FEIDE -E is a distributed federation with centralized broker for the Norwegian national education sector. Users register username and password with own home organization. Users authenticate to web services via FEIDE's centralized login service. The service provider receives user attributes from the user's home institution. The service providers never sees the user's password, credential. It only receives user attributes that it need to know in order to provide the service. Okay, and continue it. FEIDE has formal agreements with the universities and schools before they are connected. Home institutions, universities and schools are responsible for keeping user data correct and up to date. Service providers decide themselves what services their own users and other users should be able to access via FEIDE's central log in service. Okay, I think this is a good example. Uh, so the scenario is illustrated like this. The user request service from service provider service provider return uh, okay it is uh, shown here let's read it one user requests access to service two service provider sends authentication request to feide and displays feide login form to user three User enters name and password in FEIDE login form, which are sent for validation to home institution of user. 4. Home institution confirms authentic user and provides user attributes to FEIDE which forwards these to SP5. Service provider analyzes user attributes and provides service according to policy. Okay, and uh, there is another example scenario of ID portal MinID. This is the ID portal Norway broker credentials providers bank ID confides bypass min ID these are the services and they are all provided by government service providers in Turkey we also ha have e-government as you know we use it 
e-government is used to authenticate many services such as uh, when we want to log in our uh, let's say UYAP or we want to log in to uh, Gmail and such or Enables I am sure you know that you know those we use the government login e debit e government one user requests service access to service provider sends authentication request to id portal and displays id portal login form to user three user selects credentials provider enters name and password in login form which are sent for validation to credentials provider of user four credentials provider confirms authentic user and provides user attributes to id portal which forwards these to sp5 service provider analyzes user attributes and provides service according to policy okay noru egov distributed fed with broker so this is norway e-government system distributed with federation with broker authentication methods are uh, grouped like here and uh, there is identity portal okay you get the idea how it works i will take a pause here okay so introduction to logical access control physical access control not the theme today okay yes <clears throat> logical access control this lecture <clears throat> okay basic concepts access control security models how to define which subjects can access which objects with which access modes Three classical approaches, discretionary access control, DAC, mandatory access control, MAC, role-based access control, RBAC. Advanced approach for distributed environments, attribute-based access control, ABAC, generalization of DAC, MAC and RBAC. Okay. Access modes. Modes of access, authorization specify the access permissions of subjects, users, when accessing objects, resources. If you are authorized to access a resource, what are you allowed to do to the resource? Example, possible access permissions include, read, observe, write, observe and alter, execute, neither observe nor alter, append, alter. DAC, MAC according to the Orange Book, TCSEC. TCSEC, 1985, specifies two AC security models. Discretionary AC, DAC, AC policy based on user identities, e.g. John has R, W, access to HR files. R and W are uh, read and write. Uh, HR, I don't know what is it, and Mary has read and write to sales. Okay, so you see, they have different uh, read and access, they have different access rights for different subjects. Okay. Mandatory AC, Mac. AC policy based on security labels, e.g. secret clearance needed for access. Okay, yes, yeah, secret clearance, uh, we usually see that on um, movies, it is the same. DAC, Discretionary Access Control. Access authorization is specified and enforced based on the identity of the user. DAC is typically implemented with ACL, Access Control Lists. Yes, this is usually what we do. Uh, we specify specific uh, access controls to specific 
user groups such as admin user or uh, lecturer or uh, student or guest and such you usually see that on forums if you are using that moderators uh, section moderators global moderators uh, administrators and such DAC is discretionary in the sense that the owner of the resource can decide at his her discretion who is authorized operating systems using DAC Windows and Linux okay DAC principles AC matrix general list of authorizations impractical too many empty cells okay so if you use access control matrix for each object you see uh, it is impractical because too many empty cells there are for example subject names okay let's fix this from the uh, slides Okay, so the subject names are being uh, the users. You see, each user has specific rights to each object. Object 1, read and write. Object 2, nothing. Object 3, X. Uh, object 4, read and such. And I will update the PowerPoint and publish it as PDF file. Okay, Doc Principles. Okay, and there is also access control lists acl okay associated with an object represent columns from ac matrix tells who can access the object so this is a rather different uh, representation in this case you hold lists and the lists hold uh, access rights for each user for each object okay ACL in Unix. Each file and directory has an associated ACL. Three access operations read from a file write to a file execute a file. So X is execute. Access applied to a directory, read, list contents of dir write, create or rename files in dir execute, search directory. DIR is directory. Permission bits are grouped in three triples that define read, write, and execute access for owner, group, and others. A indicates that the specific access write is not granted. RWRR means read and write access for the owner, read access for group and for others world. So read and write for uh, owners and no permission to execute. And this is read access for group and this is read for the rest. Okay. RWX means read, write and execute access for the owner, no rights for group and no rights for others. Okay, and for example, I can show you what does this mean in Windows terms. When I click properties and click security, you see uh, it shows me that my account have full control, modify, read and execute, read, write and special permissions. And administrators are same and the system is same. When I click advanced it, uh, more options uh, appears. You see there is auditing, effective access, permissions and i can click weave from advanced permissions okay 
Full Control, Traverse Folder, Release Folder, Read Attributes, Read Extended Attributes, Create Files. You see, each of that, each of these are different permissions, and each account uh, composed on Windows can have different access uh, permissions. There is also I will show you something else. You can change uh, directory permission as well. Uh, from here, let's click edit. And from here, uh, can I remove it? No. Can I remove this? No. Okay, I can say deny. Okay, when I say deny, let's see what happens. Oh, since I am both administrator and Furkan, user account, it wouldn't work anyway. So you get the idea of uh, permissions. Capabilities. Focus on the subjects. Access rights stored with subjects represents rows of AC matrix must be impossible for users to create fake capabilities. Subjects may grant own capabilities to other subjects. Subjects may grant the right to grant rights. Challenges. How to check who may access a specific object? How to revoke a capability? Similar to SAML security token. Mac, mandatory access control. Access authorization is specified and enforced with security labels, security clearance for subjects, classification levels for objects. Mac compares subject and object labels. Mac is mandatory in the sense that users do not control access to the resources they create. A system wide set of AC policy rules for subjects and objects determine modes of access. OS with Mac, SE Linux supports Mac. Mac principles, labels. Security labels can be assigned to subjects and objects, can be strictly ordered security levels, e.g., confidential, or secret, can also be partially ordered categories, e.g., sales dep, HR dep. Dominance relationship between labels LALB means that label LA dominates label LB. Object labels are assigned according to sensitivity. Subject labels are determined by security clearance. Access control decisions are made by comparing the subject label with the object label according to specific model. MAC is typically based on Bell Lapidula model. See later. So subject compare object, okay. Bell Lapidula, the classical Mac model. SS property, simple security, no read up, a subject should not be able to read files with a higher label than its own label, because otherwise it could cause unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information, so you should only be able to read documents with an equal or lower label as your security clearance level. Asterisk property, star property, no write down, subjects working on information, tasks at a given level should not be allowed to write to a lower level, because otherwise it could create unauthorized information flow. So you should only be able write to files with an equal or higher label as your security clearance level. Bell Lapidula, Mac model, SS property, no read up. Okay, so current subject label is secret. Therefore, we can read secret and confidential uh, objects. However, we cannot read top secret because it is higher level than our 
uh, secret level and current or subject label is secret therefore we cannot write to confidential uh, objects however we can write to secret and top secret objects okay labels in bell la padula Users have a clearance level LSM subject max level users log on with a current clearance level LSC subject current level where LSC LSM objects have a sensitivity level low object SS property allows read access when LSC low asterisk property allows write access when LSC low. Okay, so the relationships are shown like this uh subject max level clearance uh, right access subject current label here and possible read access okay so the dominance comes from top to bottom okay there is also wikipedia anyway if you wonder more if you wonder more information you can check it out combined mac and dac combining access control approaches a combination of mandatory and discretionary access control approaches is often used mac is applied first dac applied second after positive mac access granted only if both mac and dac positive combined mac dac ensures that no owner can make sensitive information available to unauthorized users and need to know can be applied to limit access that would otherwise be granted under mandatory rules RBAC role based access control A user has access to an object based on the assigned role Roles are defined based on job functions Permissions are defined based on job authority and responsibilities within a job function Operations on an object are invocated based on the permissions The object is concerned with the user's role and not the user Okay, so there is user role one. You see, you can assign multiple roles to a user, and each role has different um, permissions to different files. User change frequently roles don't. Okay. Eba can be configured to do, to do Mac and or DAC. RBAC privilege principles. Roles are engineered based on the principle of least privilege. A role contains the minimum amount of permissions to instantiate an object. A user is assigned to a role that allows her to perform only what's required for that role. All users with the same role have the same permissions. Actually, uh, the Windows uh, uses this as well. You see there is administrative role, user role, and guest role, such as that. ABAC and XACML. ABAC equals attribute based access control. ABAC specifies access authorizations and approves access through policies combined with attributes. The policy rules can apply to any type of attributes, user attributes, resource attribute, context attributed, etc. XACML used to express ABAC attributes and policies. XACML equals extensible access control markup language. The XACML standard defines a language for expressing access control attributes and policies implemented in XML, and a processing model describing how to evaluate access requests according to the rules defined in policies. XACML attributes are typically structured in ontologies. Attribute-based access control. 
ABAC makes AC decisions based on Boolean conditions on attribute values. Subject, object, context, and action consist of attributes. Subject attributes could be name, sex, dob, role, etc. Each attribute has a value, e.g., name subject equals Alice, sex subject equals F, role subject equals HR staff, access type action equals read, write, owner, object equals HR, type object equals salary. The AC logic analyzes all attribute equals value tuples that are required by the relevant policy. E.g. permit if role subject equals HR staff and access type action equals read and owner object equals HR and time query equals office hours. Okay, so the ABAC model is AC policies, meta policy, policy one, two, three, context conditions, and access action request by the subject. ABCA functions, AZ, AC decision logic, AC enforcement. So it checks subject attributes, name, affiliation, clearance, etc., et et object attributes, type, owner classification, etc., and if they are matching access to object. Global consistence. Okay. ABAC systems require an XML terminology to express all possible attributes and their values, must be consistent across the entire domain, e.g. the attribute role and all its possible values, e.g. role subject equals HR staff must be known and interpreted by all systems in the AC security domain. Requires standardization, e.g. for access to medical journals, medical terms must be interpreted in a consistent way by all systems, current international work on XML of medical terms, consistent interpretation of attributes and values is a major challenge for implementing ABAC. ABAC, plus and on the positive side, ABAC is much more flexible than DAC, MAC or RBAC, DAC, MAC and RBAC can be implemented with ABAC, can use any type of access policies combined with an unlimited number of attributes, suitable for access control in distributed environments, e.g. national e-health networks. On the negative side, requires defining business concepts in terms of XML and ontologies which is much more complex than what is required in traditional DAC, MAC or RBAC systems. Political alignment and legal agreements required for ABAC in distributed environments. Meta policies I, C, O, inconsistent policies, subdomain authorities define their own policies, potential for conflicting policies, e.g. two policies dictate different access decisions, meta policy rules needed in case the ABAC logic detects policy rules that lead to opposite decisions. Meta policy takes priority over all other policies, e.g. meta policy deny overrides, if one policy denies access, but another policy approves access, then access is denied. This is a conservative meta policy. Meta policy approve overrides, if one policy denies access, but another policy approves access, then access is approved. This is a lenient meta policy. Okay, so I want to check something.
If a Windows object does not have a Discretionary Access Control List DACL, the system allows everyone full access to it. If an object has a DACL, the system allows only the access that is explicitly allowed by the Access Control Entries ACES in the DACL. If there are no ACES in the DACL, the system does not allow access to anyone. Similarly, if a DACL has ACES that allow access to a limited set of users or groups, the system implicitly denies access to all trustees not included in the ACES. Okay, so you see Windows uses this creationary access control list and access control entries. In most cases, you can control access to an object by using access allowed ACES, you do not need to explicitly deny access to an object. The exception is when an ACE allows access to a group and you want to deny access to a member of the group. To do this, place an access denied ACE for the user in the DACL ahead of the access allowed ACE for the group. Note that the order of the ACEs is important because the system reads the ACEs in sequence until access is granted or denied. The user's access denied ACE must appear first, otherwise, when the system reads the group's access allowed ACE, it will grant access to the restricted user. The following illustration shows a DACL that denies access to one user and grants access to two groups. The members of Group A get read, write, and execute access rights by accumulating the rights allowed to Group A and rights allowed to everyone. The exception is Andrew, who is denied access by the access denied ACE in spite of being a member of the Everyone group. Okay, so you see this is how uh, Win32 authorization works. By the way, I don't know if this is... Uh, this applies to recent Windows. Win32 API. Yeah, probably still applies to uh, newest Windows versions as well. Win32 API. Yes, okay. So you see, uh, this is how it is used in real life application and in Windows. You get the idea. Uh, I will make an addition to your uh, final project uh, which is related to uh, course attendance uh, now I will show you that rule okay So the name rule is about your uh, comments that you have been making or you should have been making to our videos. Okay, so... Everyone will be sending a Word or PDF document along with their final project files. This document will contain screenshots of your all comments to the lecture videos. All of the 14 lecture videos if there are more you of course all of them uh, but i am supposing that there will be 14. take screenshots with high resolution your comment has to be clearly readable those who fail to send this document will be counted as not attended to the lectures therefore they will get ff okay so this is the uh, new rule i have uh, decided this is not an extra rule actually you should already have been making uh, comments therefore this is nothing uh, new uh, but be aware of that okay okay let's close this and this Okay, let's upload to our GitHub repository.
Okay, it is updated. So it is uh, sufficient for this week. Hopefully see you next week. Uh, please try to uh, be careful with the coronavirus and hopefully see you.